Menelaus had not sat long beside the tomb, pondering what Helen's plan was to be, when a train of huntsmen with their hounds descended the flowery terraces of the cliff, headed by the king. Theoclymenus was a young man of fine presence, his features resembled his sister's, but lacked her serenity of expression, from his lowering brow it might be guessed that the day's sport had not pleased him. At his gesture of dismissal, the train withdrew to the rear of the palace, he himself was approaching the great doorway when Helen came forth again, in such guise that Menelaus scarcely repressed a cry of dismay. Her glorious hair was cut short, her face whitened to ghastliness, and a coarse black mantle enveloped her completely. Theoclymenus rushed to meet her, exclaiming, Queen of my heart, what sudden woe is this? Whom do you mourn? Not, not my sister? No, my husband, answered Helen, and forthwith burst into violent weeping. And now good cause had Menelaus to admire a woman's wit, as with many a sob and sigh she replied to the king's eager questioning. Of himself, Theoclymenus fortunately took no notice, after a single glance at the alleged sailor, whose rags and squalor bore eloquent witness to the truth of Helen's tale. Had he deigned another look, he would have seen that the castaway was in a state of extraordinary agitation. Menelaus, indeed, could hardly contain himself when the Egyptian, taking Helen's hand, addressed her in these words. Believe me, O, oh, world's desire, I mourn the death of so gallant a prince as report calls Menelaus, yet I scorn to conceal that this news is far from unwelcome to me, for to all my pleading, you have ever answered that while he lived, you were his alone. And trust me, no less than your peerless beauty has this constancy won my heart. But now, Put away unavailing sorrow, for in me you will have a husband as royal and, I promise you, as loving, as he whom you have lost. Nay, withdraw not this lovely hand, let it rest in mine for token of our troth plight. Great Lord of Egypt, said Helen, casting down her eyes, if the hand of a faded, desolate woman seem to you worth the taking, it is yours. At this reply, both her hearers started violently. But Helen, as she drew back from the king's outstretched arms, darted at Menelaus a look so expressive that he controlled his rage. Nay, wait, she said, sweetly, I have a boon to ask, my lord. Name it, fairest of women, replied her enraptured suitor, and take it, to the half of my kingdom. Before we wed, she continued, I desire to pay funeral honors to Menelaus, according to the custom of our land. You shall do so, said the king, and I, for my part, will build him the grandest monument that has ever been seen in Egypt. But what manner of funeral rites do the Greeks pay to those who are lost at sea? I will tell you, said Helen. We have a ship fitted out as for a voyage and loaded with offerings to the departed, jewels, rich robes, golden vessels, and, for a warrior, great store of fine weapons and armor. On this the chief mourners embark and, having gone far out to sea, that nothing may be washed ashore, they cast their gifts overboard together with meat offerings and drink offerings in abundance, praying the dead to accept them with favor. This I must do for Menelaus, lest if he lie unhonored in his vast and wandering grave, his spirit haunt us and bring a curse upon our house. I will have a ship made ready instantly, said the king, furnished with all you need, and the offering shall be the most precious things in my treasury. Only I do not like you to go, I cannot spare you now, my own. Cannot another, cannot the sailor here do the office of chief mourner? What, a man of low degree, exclaimed Helen in a shocked tone. True, that would be unseemly, said the Eclimenus. I will go myself, then. The king of Egypt will pay the last honors to a brother king. Royally spoken, said Helen. But that must not be. By our Greek custom, it is I, his nearest and dearest, who must perform the last rites, and no stranger must share in them. Be it as you will, answered Theoclymenus, somewhat sulkily. I am loath to cross you in anything at such a moment. So saying, he went hastily into the palace. It was easily seen he was a master whose commands brooked no delay, so quickly the work went forward. 
Within two hours, a splendid fifty-oared galley lay manned and freighted by the marble jetty near the palace, her sails were set, Helen embarked, closely followed by the ragged sailor, and as the galley stood out to sea, the king watched with admiration the graceful black-robed figure leaning on the bulwarks in an attitude of profound sorrow. Certainly, thought he, I am a happy man. This grief of Helen's for a husband she has not seen these ten years proves what a loyal wife she will make me. And it is a piece of good luck that Menelaus did not get ashore like that sailor, for it saves me the unpleasantness of having to kill him. The galley was no sooner out of sight than Theoclemenus hastened to the women's quarter of the palace, eager to discuss his new happiness with his sister. He would have sought her before, but in his zeal he had himself superintended the lading of the ship with treasures worthy of his magnificence. With some vexation, he learned from her women that the princess desired to be alone. In this, however, there was nothing unusual, for Theono spent much of her time in seclusion, reading and meditating the mystic lore of ancient scrolls, written by the hands of priests. The king himself never ventured to disturb her at these studies, so he betook himself to the shore again, there to wait Helen's return with what patience he could. Lower and lower sank the sun towards his ocean bed, and still no sail appeared in the offing, and still, though he grew more and more impatient, no misgiving crossed the king's mind. He wished a hundred times over that Greek custom did not require Helen to make her funeral offerings so far from land, but that was the only reason for her delay that occurred to him. What, then, was his amazement when he heard the patter of many bare feet behind him, and turning, saw the whole crew of the galley running along the shore toward the palace. With a furious cry, he rushed to intercept them, and at sight of him, the slaves threw themselves on their faces, as giving themselves up for loss. Dogs, and sons of dogs, he shouted, What means this? Where is the ship? Where is Queen Helen? If harm has come to her, you shall all be flayed alive. Where is she, I say? Why do you not answer me, wretches? But the slaves only groveled round his feet, speechless with terror. Transported with rage, the king seized the nearest by the throat, uttering horrid threats and brandishing his dagger, at that moment a hand touched his shoulder, and the calm voice of Theono said, Forbear, my brother, these men are guiltless. Be not so unkingly as to visit on them the act of others, but promise them life and favor if they declare the truth. You know, Theono, he answered, that your word is law with me. Let them arise then, and speak without fear. You there, the steersman, say on, and say quickly. Then the slaves rose up, no longer trembling, they cast on Theono such adoring looks as they might on a protecting goddess, and the steersman told his tale with a good courage. Oh, son of Egypt, he said, by your august command I and my fellows obeyed the Greek queen as we should have done yourself. Now, when we had gone but a little way, she said to me, Turn the ship about, friend, and steer as this sailor bids you and the shipwrecked sailor directed our course to the far side of the isle, where the great cavern is, and the water is deep inshore, there he made me bring the ship to land. Then, indeed, we smelt treason for behold, some fifty men ran to us out of the cavern, whom we perceived to be Greeks. But the sailor said to us, Fear nothing, these are comrades of mine who have likewise escaped out of the shipwreck. Let them come aboard to help in the work before us. So they came and immediately that villain sailor bade them take up the swords and spears that were piled on the deck. Then he cried, Out of the galley, Egyptians, or you are all dead men. Alas, Lord, what could we do against those ruffians, unarmed as we were, and they great sturdy fellows everyone? They flew upon us like lions, they thrust us overboard at the sword's point, yet more in mirth than anger, to speak truly, for loudly they laughed as we fell splash into the water and swam ashore for our lives. They took our places at the oars and backed the galley out with mighty strokes. As they put her head to sea, Queen Helen waved to us from the deck, and laughed right merrily, and that most accursed of all sailors took her in his arms and kissed her. Theoclemenus bounded where he stood. The vile traitress, he cried. Then all her story was a lie, a plot to escape me. But the man, her accomplice, whence came he, who is he? Do you not guess? said Theono. Menelaus himself. This much was true, that he was shipwrecked off our coast, whither storms had driven him, not without divine providence. As for the rest, ask yourself, my brother, why his wife dared not tell you he was here alive? I may rather ask you, said the king, bitterly, why, knowing their plot, 
you suffered them to be full and laugh to scorn the brother who loves you so well. And whom I love not less well, she answered, tenderly, as I hope to prove. Come, Theoclemenus, let us go when the sun has set, and your evening banquet is waiting. Come, this once I will break my rule of abstinence and share your meal, and afterward I shall have much to say to you. The wise princess had her will, and the king's mood softened in spite of himself as she plied him with the delicate fare and the noble wine set before them. And then she brought him to her chamber, where the great southern moon looked in through casements opening on the sea, and paled the radiance of seven golden lamps fed with amber grease. The lofty walls were covered with row on row of bright-hued blazonry, the wars and triumphs of bygone monarchs, the incarnations as beast or bird of the strange gods of Nile, displayed in endless processions of solemn and fantastic figures. Theono motioned her brother to a couch heaped with broidered pillows, seated herself near him on an ivory chair, and began to speak in low, lulling tones, slowly waving the while a fan of ibis plumes. Even thus in his childhood he had loved to hear her tell the wonder tales of ancient Egypt and the scarcely less marvelous doings of kings and heroes beyond the sea. Like one that had seen it all, she now related the story of Troy's downfall from the beginning, how Paris, king-born but reared as a shepherd, was chosen to judge the three goddesses and gave the prize of beauty, the golden apple of discord, to Aphrodite, how she promised him Helen, the world's desire, whom all believed to have fled with him to Troy, the ten years' siege, and how it ended. The king listened enthralled and, when she ceased, he said with a deep sigh, all this woe, then, was wrought by Aphrodite. The flower of the Greeks, the race and city of Troy, have perished by reason of the bribe she offered Paris. And of that she cheated him by a counterfeit. Can there indeed be such perfidy in celestial minds? To that goddess, replied his sister, I render no worship, as you know, yet let us beware of rash words concerning one whose power is so great in earth and heaven. It may be, she would have given Paris the real Helen if she could, but Zeus, lord of all, who overrules in his wisdom the purposes of the other immortals, would not have it so. For you must know that Helen, though born of a mortal mother, is not as other women. She is as it were a sacred vessel, formed and set apart by divine hands to be a pattern on earth of the beauty that is heavenly. Therefore Zeus would not suffer her to come to dishonor, but in the hour of temptation she was wrapped away to an abode of safety and peace, for such was this house to her while her father ruled it. Theoclymenus reddened at the last words and hastily said, I should not have deserved that reproach, my sister, had you told me these things earlier. How could I know that Helen was in a manner sacred and under the special protection of Zeus? It should have been enough, said Theono, softly, that you knew her to be a guest, a stranger, and defenseless. For all such are the special charge of Zeus. But I meant not to upbraid you, nay, dearest brother, I would rather crave your forgiveness for having thwarted even in duties caused the desire of your heart. My prayer is, our love for each other may yet bring you truer happiness than you could have known with Helen. Theono, exclaimed her brother, melted almost to tears, I were a heartless, thankless fool if I did not prize such love as yours above all else on earth. But I do, and you shall see it, though I have yielded too long to blind passion, by the soul of Proteus, you shall find me a changed man from this hour. Happier with you than with Helen. I, truly, for now it is as though scales had fallen from my eyes, and I see that in your face which hers lacks for all its beauty. It is truth, Theono, the stainless truth of your soul shining forth, a light wherein a man may trust. I need but look at you to know you would die a thousand deaths rather than weave the tissue of lies Helen did today. Theono pressed his hand and said, with her rare and lovely smile, but those falsehoods, remember, were told to save the man she loved. And if Helen is not one to die for truth's sake, she would die for him, yes, the Eclimenus, she has the courage to do that, and more than that, though she ever seemed compact of sweet weaknesses. Think, was it not more bitter than death to her to renounce the last hope of home, to tell Menelaus she had only pretended to be herself, and so let him leave her forever, without a word or look to still the heart, hunger of ten widowed years? And she did it, her nature rose to that height in the hour of need. Ah, my brother! That is what we must remember when we think of Helen. Others will know her only as the loveliest of created women, the world's desire, her beauty and her falseness will be sung and told from age to age in other lands. But we of Egypt will preserve the memory of the real Helen, to us, she shall stand forever as the type of woman's faithfulness, woman's divine self-sacrifice.